Okay, let's get started. Um, once again, we moved some of the All the Devils Are Here readings back um, a week, <coughs> largely so that you can read the book again in the time before the midterm, because about a third of the midterm is going to be on All the Devils Are Here as a kind of police the reading exercise. As you'll see if you take a look at problem set six, which is our sample exam, which is now out and which is due a week from now at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, March 8th here. And do write your section times on the front. And as I said, midterm one is on March 10th. We'll try to grade it and get it back as quickly as possible so you have an idea of how well you're doing in this course. One more logistics thing, our commercial for the Berkeley Blum Center Friday Political Economy Colloquium. Um, we have Alan Karras and Mark Healy and also Tyler Stovall from the Dean's Office signed up to talk about the value of global history for modern political economy. For those of you who are political economy majors and are wondering why we've structured the major the way we have and should we perhaps change it, we do make you take a lot of history. Um, and the question is why? We make you take rather more history than any other parallel program I know of except for possibly Harvard social studies. We're going to get Alan and Mark Healy from History and Latin American Studies and Tyler Stovall from History and the Dean's Office to come and try to explain to us why this is so. Um, time 2.10 on Friday, food at 3.10. And last time everyone agreed that the vegetables were wonderful and the cheese was excellent, but they wished there'd been some refined sugar. Um, so we'll see if we can get some refined sugar for Friday. Recapitulations, things you really should know for the midterm. Well, in addition to the economic growth models, <coughs> in addition to reading the book, um, All the Devils Are Here, in addition to reviewing the textbooks and thinking that you've gotten the identification-like things we're going to ask nailed down, the one-sentence identifications, you need to be able to use the income expenditure equation. Um, you need to be able to figure out what the level of real GDP is in an economy if we give you a whole bunch of spending flows. Um, in this case, we have our components of autonomous spending adding up to eight trillion. And the question is, if those flows of autonomous spending are eight trillion, then what is real output Y um, in this economy going to be? And they seem to be cocking down. Um, and once again, we're all spread out, um, which worries me. Um, that is, you should by now, um, you should by now be able to say, um, look, with this CY here of one and this tax rate of two, when you look at the denominator, you're going to be taking 1 and subtracting 0.8 from it, which gives you 0.2. Adding 0.2 to it gives you 0.4. Um, the multiplicative inverse of 0.4 is 2 and a half. And 2 and a half times 8 trillion is going to give you 20 trillion, um, is going to give you E. Um, and if only 28% of you are getting that now, um, you're going to find that the midterm is going to look very, very long uh, to you. Because being able to do things like this reasonably quickly and accurately is kind of key. Um, and we're going to ask you to do the investment savings version of the equation. Um, you know, that dividing the pieces of autonomous spending into those parts that are determined by monetary policy and financial markets those parts that are determined by fiscal policy and those parts of it are determined by other stuff. This is another version of the same circular flow of aggregate demand that we see in the income expenditure equation. This is often a more useful one if you're thinking about economic policy um, in any of its forms. Um, 
And here, the first part of this equation is to ask you to figure out what the multiplier is, um, what the multiplicative inverse of these terms in the denominator are. Um, and indeed, if Cy is 0.8 and if T is a 0.25, then 1 minus 0.8 times 0.75 will give you 0.6. 1 minus 0.6 will give you 0.4. Plus 0.1 will give you 0.5. The multiplicative inverse of 0.5 is going to be 2. Um, we're getting there. We're at 47%. But once again, the midterm is going to be long. Um, if these calculations aren't second nature exactly, but if these calculations aren't things you're comfortable doing, uh, because we're then going to ask you to take that multiplier um, and apply it to what happens when something goes on in financial markets, when something happens in monetary policy, or when something happens to the government's fiscal policy. How is that going to affect the level of real production um, in the economy as a whole? Um, and in order to do that, you've got to remember the multiplier from last slide. Um, and you've also got to be able to figure out what's going on in the numerator of this equation as well. Um, so let's go through it. Right? We have real interest rates rising by five percentage points, smaller than the spike in junk bond interest rates that we saw in the 2008 collapse um, of the US and the world economy, but still very sizable. Um, how big an effect is this going to have on real GDP? Um, well, we have an I sub R, a sensitivity of investment to the real interest rate of 10, um, sensitivity of exports to the, real, to the real exchange rate of a half, but a sensitivity of the real exchange rate to interest rates of 10. Add these two terms together, and that gives you a sensitivity of autonomous spending to the interest rate of 15. Multiply 15 by 0.05, by 5%, um, and you get 0.75. Multiply 0.75 by your multiplier coefficient of 2, and you get 1.5 trillion. The interest rate's going up, um, which means that real income is going down. Um, so the correct answer here is going to be B. Um, and once again, things are going to go much, e much more easily for you on the midterm if you can nail um, these types of questions and nail them successfully relatively quickly. Um, last thing, you, we want um, to you to know not just the income expenditure, but the investment savings version of this aggregate demand model. Uh, precisely because right now we're in a configuration where truly extraordinary things happen to the interest rates at which interest-sensitive um, businesses that want to expand their capacity or even their continue their operations you know, find that they have to borrow. Um, we are right now in our 9% unemployment fix because of this enormous spike in long-term risky real interest rates, um, because the Federal Reserve's attempts to keep it from happening by lowering safe short-term nominal interest rates to zero wasn't nearly a big enough policy move to offset the things that were going on in financial markets. Ad use who had this panicked flight by investors and banks out of all securities perceived to be risky into securities perceived to be safe. And even though now, as best we can tell, the terms at which businesses can borrow are back, if not to normal, um, at least not to some terribly, terribly bad level, the economy is still in a substantial fix. Um, and one question is why. Um, we're going to review that in a little while. One last thing that we hope you remember, um, that when you look at the investment savings version of our aggregate demand equation, um, you can see where fiscal policy comes in, where changes in government's purchases come in. And you can affect tax policy too by changing the tax rate, but I don't think we really have time to go into that. We'll stick with changes in government spending as the principal modality of fiscal policy, which they are.
boosting government purchases in an attempt to get unemployment down to normal levels and production up to where it should be. Um, then we have all the things that go on in financial markets and with monetary policy. Um, the first of which is the short-term safe nominal interest rate, this thing that the Federal Reserve controls via its open market operations that it can nail um, and that it does nail when it wants to. Um, then on top of that you have the term premium. Um, the fact that the Federal Reserve controls short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates are in large part a guess as to what the Federal Reserve is going to do in the future. When businesses, investors, and savers expect the Federal Reserve to rapidly raise short-term interest rates in the future, this term premium is going to be large. When they expect its policies to persist and to keep interest rates low for a long time, this term is going to be small. This is an expectational variable, the kind of expectation of the persistence of the Federal Reserve's current policy. Um, the Federal Reserve can affect this through jawboning, um, through talking, through communications, and also through establishing a track record of following through on its policies. Otherwise, this is very hard to move. You have expected inflation, which enters into this determination of total spending with a minus sign, because if nominal interest rates, holding nominal interest rates fixed, if expected inflation is higher, businesses are going to say, hey, um, we can borrow and then pay back our borrowing cheaply in depreciated dollars. We should borrow a lot and invest a lot. Um, want to get an economy out of a really deep downturn, out of a Great Depression, if you can create some expected inflation. That's a wonderful way to do that. Um, Federal Reserve doesn't want to create expected inflation for reasons we'll go into after the midterm right now. So this as a tool of policy is essentially off the table. Um, so you're left with in financial markets and the Federal Reserve normal open market operations which are now tapped out. Um, claims by the Federal Reserve it's going to continue low interest rate easy money policies for a long time to come which are of limited credibility and it's too late for the Federal Reserve to change its credibility. Um, and then there's the risk premium. Um, and the risk premium here, um, the risk premium here is not as big as it used to be, um, but it's still pretty big. Um, and the risk premium is affected by two things. First, by how risk averse investors and savers are, combined with how much risk they think is out there in the system. <coughs> right now they still think there's a lot of risk out there in the system and they are risk averse. And the second thing is how much risk they have to bear. Um, how much of the financial risks in the economy has the Federal Reserve and the Treasury taken onto their own backs by guaranteeing debts and by buying up risky assets themselves. <coughs> the Federal Reserve and the Treasury can affect um, this term by offering loan guarantees and by buying up risky assets. The problem over the past two and a half years has been that this has been a politically difficult thing to do and an expensive thing to do. And hence the Federal Reserve and the Treasury have not done as much of it um, as I would have thought. Um, and I think that's landed us in a situation in which our economy's in significant trouble and is going to stay in significant trouble for quite a while to come. And in order to explain that, I'm going to want to make a relatively minor digression and detour into something called Oaken's Law after the chairman of Lyndon Johnson's Council of Economic Advisors, Arthur Oaken. Um, this is what Arthur Oaken noticed back in the 1960s was that there seemed to be a fairly stable and regular relationship between the unemployment rate and the level of production. Here for the years for the 2000s um, are what the relationship between unemployment and production is. That is, when production is growing at more than 2.6% per year, the unemployment rate's likely to fall. When production's growing at less than 2.6% per year, the unemployment rate's likely to rise. Um, 
this 2.6% per year growth rate, <coughs> that Arthur Oaken called the growth rate of potential GDP. That's the growth rate of the economy's productive potential, how fast the economy can grow without putting either more or less pressure on the labor market um, to, find more, to find more jobs or more workers. Um, and then this thing has a nice steady slope, a slope of about a half. Um, for each one percentage point that growth over a year falls short of 2.6%, um, you'll see the unemployment rate rise by half a percentage point. For each one percentage point by which growth in a year exceeds, um, you exceeds 2.6%, um, you'll find the unemployment rate going down by half a percent. Um, given that right now we're expecting growth to be about 4% in mm -hmm. 2011, um, we'll take 4%, subtract 2.6% for potential growth from it, you get 1.4%. Divide 1.4% by, um, you know, by 2 and you get 0.7%. Take the 9.4 percentage points of... Um, unemployment in December 2010, subtract 0.7 percentage points from them, and you get a predicted unemployment rate as of the end of 2011 of 8.7 percent. Um, and project that growth rate forth for another year, and you get a projected unemployment rate of 8 percent um, for the end of Barack Obama's first term which would give him the worst unemployment record of any presidential term since the Great Depression itself. Um, a somewhat puzzling thing given that back in October 2008, Larry Summers was writing op-eds for Barack Obama about how the important thing is not to do too little um, to fight this gathering recession and not to let it hang on. Um, now, why is this slope 0.5? Um, why is the slope half? Why is it when, when GDP goes down by 1%, unemployment rises by only half a percentage point? Um, you'd expect that if GDP goes down by one percentage point, well, you're making 1% fewer less stuff, um, you should need 1% less workers. In fact, maybe you should need even fewer workers than that. Maybe you should fire more than 1% of your workers if production falls by 1% because your capital and natural resources are still there and they're still being productive. Why is it a half um, rather than one or something bigger than one? Um, well, there are, say, um, four reasons. Um, the first is simply discouraged workers. This is the unemployment rate. If someone is fired and then drops out of the labor force because they don't think they can get another job, they don't show up in the unemployment rate at all. And so your act, businesses are actually firing not half a percent of their workers when production goes down by 1%. They're actually firing about 0.7% of workers for each 1% that production goes down. But a bunch of those are going straight out of the labor force. Um, second is hours. Um, a bunch of firms respond to slack demand not by firing workers, but by cutting back on the hours that people work. Third is there is some pro-cyclical productivity um, in there. There are a bunch of places in the economy where to boost production by 1% requires less than half a percentage point increase in your number of workers, and when you try to cut back production, you find you really can't cut back workers proportionately and still make the system go. But fourth and last, we have, or we used to have, something called labor hoarding, by which businesses would say, hey, we like our employees a lot. They're skilled, they have lots of training. If they were to wander off, we couldn't really replace them very well. As long as we're confident that this current economic downturn is going to be relatively short, we're going to want to keep these workers around. Um, we're going to still want to keep them on the payroll, even if we have nothing for them to do. We can put them to work painting the factory uh, or doing something else. And that also tended to make this Oaken's law line um, significantly flatter than you would think it would be from just the basic engineering of production. Um, and hence our problem in 2009. 
right, that we have this nice Oaken's law relationship with you know, a bunch of pluses and minuses above it. Um, two, the year 2008 was not at all exceptional. The year 2009 goes absolutely boing. Right? The unemployment rate rises um, by an extra 1.7 percentage points relative to what we would have expected to rise given what happened to production. If we'd simply looked at production and at the normal Oaken's Law relationship, we'd have expected our unemployment rate at the end of 2009 to be 8.3% nationwide. Instead, it was way up there at 10%. Um, and that extra 1.7% that extra 1.7% has not, did not come back in 2010. Um, we hope it'll come back in 2011 that we'll see better employment performance than output performance would warrant, but we're not at all sure that we will. So this Oaken's Law framework, by which there is this nice stable relationship between production and employment and the unemployment rate seems to have broken down that businesses seem to have taken advantage of 2009 to fire a lot more workers than they would have normally. Yeah? I'm just curious about how this extends back into the 20th century. Does the same law hold up? All the way back to 1945. It's remarkably stable. Uh, before the 1945, it's, things are different because the Great Depression is so large and because America is substantially an agrarian economy. Um, what Christy Romer and company said when they were working for Obama and had to write about this. Um, well, they said that the fit of Oaken's law is usually good. The relationship has broken down somewhat. Um, you know, I tend not to think that two and a half million extra unemployed is a somewhat. Um, but... And they went on to say that um, it's not because anything unusual is happening to the labor force. Um, what's happening is because businesses are taking advantage of the recession to try to make workers work harder and improve productivity. Um, instead of acting in a labor hoarding vein, by which you say the most important thing in a recession is to keep the workers will like to have for the next boom around in the future, so that they're still there when demand recovers and we don't have to worry so much about increasing productivity during the recession. Businesses during the recession seem to have decided this time that their first priority was to cut labor costs and improve the efficiency of their operations as fast as possible, which is not something that Arthur Oaken had taken into account and not something that we saw in the US economy in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 1970s. Um, but we did see this a little bit. Um, if we had been looking very carefully during the 2001-2003 economic downturn, um, we'd have seen, say, you take the scatter um, of hours growth, of growth in total hours worked, um, and of growth in total output along the vertical axis, and you just look at where the economy runs from 1960 to 2003, you get this large cloud of points. Um, and then in 2002 and 2003, you find yourself out at the extreme um, of this cloud, um, leaving the cloud, breaking new ground. That even though output is growing at 2% per year in the nine quarters ending at the end of 2003, um, it's still the case that businesses had been cutting hours at a pace of 2% per year over those previous nine quarters. Um, so we've seen signs of this before. Not nearly as large a phenomenon as we see now. Total effect on the unemployment rate, something like, um, well, a little less than half a percentage point um, by the time you take 2001, 2002, and 2003 together. Uh, but still some definite signs of something happening somewhat analogous to what happened in 2009, albeit spread out. Um, now, two researchers at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Erica Groshen and Simon Potter, started looking at this in 2003. 
saying something odd is happening to Oaken's law. Um, we don't see the usual cyclical pattern um, that we're used to seeing um, in America. And they then went back and looked in more detail at the data from 1991 and 1992, from the last recession before 2002 and 2003, and thought, once again, there's something odd going on here. Right? The emergence of a new kind of recovery, one driven mostly by productivity increases um, rather than payroll gains, um, signs that what's going on in the business cycle, in the economic downturn, is not just a cyclical reduction in employment that then will be reversed when the recovery comes, but instead some kind of structural change that's transforming firms industries and economies. Um, and they began to wonder whether there was, quote, a preponderance of structural adjustments during the most recent recession, and pointing out that job losses that stem from structural changes are permanent, and hence that we'd expect a long lag before employment rebounded, after a downturn whose principal impulse was some kind of structural shift rather than some kind of normal cyclical downturn. Um, and so they took a look at what happened to industries in the 1980s and in the early 2000s recession. Um, and what they found in the 1980s recession is that those businesses that lost jobs during the recession, um, those businesses that are on the left half um, of the graph, are businesses that gain jobs during the recovery, with primary metals and general building contractors being kind of way up there. They lose a lot of jobs during the recession. Um, they gain a lot of jobs during the recovery. Um, why do they do this? Well, because of the causes of the 1980s recession. You see that the late 1970s were a period of many oil shocks, um, rising inflationary spirals, the inflation rate crossing 10% per year, um, the Federal Reserve going increasingly nervous because people were expecting not just that last year's inflation would continue, but were expecting that inflation was going to rise. This seemed to them to be deranging the ability of the price system to do its job because when prices are rising at 10% per year, practically all the ideas you have in the back of your head about how much things should cost are really no longer valid. And so people become lousy comparison shoppers, both at the consumer and at the business level. <coughs> and a market economy can only work well if people are doing well as comparison shoppers. Therefore, in 1979, when Paul Volcker took over the Fed as its chairman, um, he said that we are going to raise interest rates as high as we need to in order to reduce inflation down to normal levels and we simply won't look at what we're doing to employment for a while. So the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to previously unseen levels during the early 1980s, and the result is that capital becomes extremely expensive for businesses to get, and what are the businesses that depend most on being able to access capital at reasonable terms? Well, the first is housing, right? Gen apartment buildings general construction as well. Because when you're building a building, you're building something that's going to last for 50 years. Um, and so if the interest rate is high, well then the value of that building 50 years out is going to be absolutely negligible. And so higher interest rates mean the value of what you're producing if you're in the building business goes way, way down. Um, and hence buildings respond the most to high interest rates by reducing employment and to reductions in interest rates by increasing employment. Something similar for primary metals. Um, primary metal industries are the industries that make the stuff, that make the stuff, that make the stuff, that make the capital goods that businesses buy in order to produce. Um, so you have on the order of four gearings there that they're not just sensitive to the level of production, they're sensitive to the rate of change of the level of production, and even to the rate of change of the rate of change of the level of production.
So by the time you slip those derivatives into there, primary metals are also very sensitive to interest rates because they affect investment flows and primary metal industries are our principal input into the whole investment goods sector. Um, on the other hand, we had industries like railroad transportation, which was then on a very long-term decline in the 1980s with the rise of containerized trucking as a potential offset and of air travel as well. They lost a bunch of jobs in the recession. They kept losing jobs um, in the recovery. On the countercyclical side, there's oil and gas. One other cause of recessions in the late 1970s and the early 1980s was rapidly rising oil prices. Rising oil prices will induce energy intensive businesses to fire people um, and then also induce people to go to work in oil and gas extraction um, as a classic counter cyclical industry. If the price of oil goes to $200 a barrel this year, and if the US economy enters a renewed recession, you can bet that one industry sector that is going to be doing very well will be oil and gas extraction, as we put all kinds of people to work in Colorado, in Texas, in Alberta, um, who are pulling out oil and gas. Um, and then there was the ongoing financialization of the US economy, the growth of the financial sector. Now, the number of securities and commodities brokers grew during the recession and grew during the recovery as well. That's what you'd expect to see happen in a labor hoarding recession. Um, you'd expect to see a lot of businesses lose jobs because interest rates have gone up, because the Federal Reserve has hit the economy on the head with a brick of high interest rates. But people expect interest rates will go down. When interest rates will go down again, then all of a sudden all those businesses that shrank during the recession will want to grow during the recovery. And so you want to keep your skilled and experienced workers around even through the recession so you can put them back to work um, when the recovery comes. By contrast, Groshen and Potter said, you really don't see that happening in the recession of the early 2000s. Um, you see non-depository institutions, um, by which they largely mean mortgage lenders um, and investment banks, growing in the recession, growing in the recovery. Um, you see electronic equipment, um, Silicon Valley, man manufacturing, falling during the recession and falling in labor during the recovery. Um, you see financialization, securities and commodities brokers at least, that part of it having passed the line. Um, and losing jobs um, in both. You don't see the kind of inverse relationship by which those businesses that lose jobs during the recession are the same businesses that gain jobs during the recovery. Um, instead, it's that jobs lost during a recession are lost. That manufacturers of electronic equipment, airlines and aircraft makers well, if not for the recession, they certainly wouldn't have fired their workers as fast. But structural changes in the economy are such they're not going to rehire anybody during the recovery. So they're not going to worry about keeping their firings during the recession low because they don't want their workers to go away. Um, instead, they're happy to see them gone. Um, that's what Erica and Simon said was going on in the recession of 2003. And as I see it, they have just won a large reputational bet because the pattern they saw in 2003 is here in spades in 2011. And this has implications um, for the type of recession and recovery we have, for what economists call V's versus L's. Um, you see, you look at most of the pre-1990 recessions in the United States since World War II. Uh, and they really look like V's. Um, they look like V's because you have a steep downturn in the share of people of the adult labor force at work, um, of the employment to population ratio. Um, and yet when the recovery comes, you have a steep upturn as well. Um, the recession has principally been caused by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Now it lowers them again. And all of a sudden, all of the pieces of the social division of labor that existed back before the recession, well, now that interest rates are low again, you want them back 
Um, and hence, you naturally slot people back into the jobs they'd had before the recession came. And your rapid fall in employment um, is then followed by a almost equally rapid recovery um, in employment. Indeed, back here in 1983 to 1986, um, I was working on my dissertation. And I kept on thinking that there ought to be something to do about business cycle asymmetry. Um, there ought to be a way to demonstrate that the process of destroying pieces of the division of labor through job loss due to deficient aggregate demand um, hurt the economy quickly on the way down. But the process of building employment back up to normal, of re-knitting the social division of labor, of finding matches for all workers and efficient ways for production, um, that you ought to be able to demonstrate that that was a slower and more time-consuming process. Um, and I couldn't do it, right? that the data simply weren't speaking uh, to me at all in any productive um, and kind of constructive way. And so I went off and found another dissertation topic. Um, then come 1995, um, you know, I was leaving the Treasury, and my successor was Dan Sickle, who was a, had been a student of David Romer back when David Romer was at Princeton. And so we were talking when he came in to take over the office, and he said, yeah, I tried to do that for my dissertation too. Um, and he was more skillful econometrically than I was, and was actually able to squeeze out some statistically significant results. Um, but they were really quite weak. Nevertheless, what we both were saying in 1995 was that, gee, if only we'd had this most recent early 1990s recession in our data set, our results would have been much, much stronger, wouldn't they? Because in the 1990 to 1995 period, employment fell steeply during the recession. And then it just sat there for two, for two and a half years in the so-called jobless recovery. Um, that, and for the first, say, year or so, the Clinton administration blamed the Bush administration for the jobless recovery, saying it's the failure of the Bush administration to adequately manage the economy that's created this unusual situation. Then the Clinton administration took over, and none of the buttons we pressed would produce employment gains either. Um, so by the end of 1994, we were seriously saying, uh-oh, um, what do we do? Have we fallen into a permanent long-term problem? And right then was when the Silicon Valley showed up, um, and the dot-com boom started. And the dot-com boom carried along with it, to call it a Walmart, a Costco boom, a superstore boom, a big box store, a department store boom, as businesses all over America found good ways to apply computer technology to wholesale and retail distribution. And that plus healthcare spending turned out to be a powerful engine of growth you know, for the subsequent, um, for the rest of the period. Um, And we went back to normal. Um, then comes the 2001 recession. And once again, it's not a V, but an L, um, which is depressing. Um, and then comes the today's unpleasantness. And it looks very much like we have an L, uh, like we have an L once again. Right? Here's the first half of the V. Um, even at the start of 2010, Barack Obama was optimistic that we'd have a second half of the V. We don't. Uh, we still have an L. It's still bouncing around away down there. Yeah? Even with the Vs in the, on the yeah. previous graph, they still seem to be kind of not... A little bit, yeah. This was what Dan Sickle and I were hoping to make our academic reputations on. The problem is it was that statistically it's not quite there. Right. You can say that the difference in slope is that there's a 15% chance you'd find that much or a larger difference in slopes for the pre-1990 period just by chance on unemployment. And unemployment's the one where things are the most um, asymmetrical. Um, but after 1990, you know, after 1990, it's not even worth writing a dissertation about. 
it's so obvious. You know, demonstrating business cycle asymmetry is no longer an interesting research topic. Um, we definitely have an L. Um, and that's what makes me think that we need significantly more um, in the way of stimulative policy right now to get the economy moving again. That is, long-term real interest rates, risky interest rates for junk bond quality investments, they're, what, um, maybe two percentage points, one and a half percentage points above normal levels now. Um, which, you know, is the deal. It, they're certainly not incredibly stimulative, but they're not incredibly contractionary. But if you're not expecting the division of labor to naturally knit itself together again as people go back to their old jobs, which they're not going to go back to in housing, in autos, um, then you'd actually want this interest rate to be substantially below normal levels in order to provide an incentive for businesses to invest. Um, right now, our fiscal policy, right, that um, our fiscal policy is not terribly stimulative. The Recovery Act um, boost to the economy is now rapidly ebbing away, and it has been offset by budget cutting in practically all of the states to an extraordinary degree, another round of budget, state budget cutting of which is about to, hurt, to hit. Our fiscal policy is right now contractionary, aimed at shrinking employment rather than boosting it. And these both seem to me to be profoundly unwise policy postures, um, given that we really don't know how to get out um, of an L without the government doing something else to boost aggregate demand. <coughs> that is, we got out of the 1990s, um, v, when Silicon Valley and the big box stores came along and began, and together along with healthcare, began hiring people at an absolutely furious rate. As healthcare spending rose and as Silicon Valley began to boom, um, we didn't really get out of the period of sluggish unemployment in the 2000s. You know, that putting a huge number of people to work in construction and in um, realty, um, in selling real estate helped but still, the peak of the 2005-2006 employment to population ratios, way below the peak that we saw in 2000 in terms of the fraction of American adults at work. And there's no real reason to think that this was unsustainable. Um, you know, there's no reason at all to think that lots of people here were taking jobs they really didn't want to take, or that inflation was on the rise, or their economy was in any sense overheated. Um, but we don't see a Silicon Valley boom coming along, and we don't see another housing boom coming along. So the question is, what is it that's going to drive American employment growth in the future in order to pull this up? And the answer would seem to be that the government has to do something to either boost public employment or that financial markets and the Federal Reserve have to do something to boost private investment by lowering real interest rates. And yet neither um, of those seems to be on the cards. Right? Um, that we would want to have responded to this, uh, to this upward spike in real interest rates by doing something to offset it, um, and we haven't. Um, and here, um, you know, this is what leaves me these days quite puzzled, um, right? Feeling that this can't really be the world that I thought I lived in, that this must be some strange alternate timeline, like the Star Trek episode where there's a mysterious transporter malfunction and they wind up in a universe in which the Enterprise is an evil oppressive force and Spock has a beard um, rather than being his normal self. Um, and um, I do have a hard time until after breakfast um, actually saying, yeah, the unemployment rate's at 9%. Um, yeah, Washington is talking not about jobs, but about how to reduce the deficit and how to reduce government spending. Um, and then I stare unproductively at the wall um, for a while and try to piece together exactly how we got here. Um, especially because I do remember back in 2008 all of us saying it's important not to underreact 
um, to this forthcoming economic <coughs> crisis that's coming. Yeah? Well, except that when we outsource, um, well, first of all, outsourcing produces a huge number of jobs in the transportation and the retail um, channel. Um, second, when we outsource, uh, right, that is when we pay someone in China or India to do work that used to be done in the United States, we pay them, they get dollars, they then have to spend those dollars. They then have to spend those dollars on something in the United States. So you'd expect the labor flows to be about equal. Um, you know, you'd expect there to be some countervailing flow as people in China who get hold of the dollars with which you used to buy Chinese-made commodities spend them on something. Um, they buy a government bond and we then use that money from that government bond in order to put someone to work in the government. Um, we, they buy a private security and the business then uses the money from that private security to boost, um, to boost its own domestic investment. That we'd expect the fact that we are a more global, we have a more globally integrated division of labor, if properly managed, um, to not be a significant negative to employment in the United States that something has to be blocking the normal channels of adjustment, which would give us either a higher, larger government sector um, or a larger amount of investment um, in this country. You know, that you expect manufacturing shifts offshore. Um, well, then services production here should rise and government production here should rise and, you know, investment spending in the United States should rise. Um, so from my perspective, that's simply a reframing of the puzzle, you know, that market economies are supposed to be very good at figuring out how to deal with shifting comparative advantage. And yet right now it isn't. Yeah? I'm just kind of wondering uh, how, like, why inflation? Why, like, you kind of keep saying, like, we're going to get out of it with minor damage, and we'll get out like, with the tools and the and yeah. the and all that. Like, I mean, that's what I was saying back in 2008. Yeah. Um, so how is that, how, how, A, can we, like, manage that, and B, how is that not causing massive inflation? Um, well, it isn't causing massive inflation, right? That if it were causing massive inflation, we'd see inflation rising and we'd see wages rising. We'd see businesses bidding against each other to hire workers away from each other, <coughs> rather than businesses sitting idle and saying, nah, we don't want to hire anybody else. We don't care that there are now five people out there for every job opening. We're not going to hire more people um, than we'd planned to before. So oh, it's a matter of supply and demand, right? That certainly the money stock is much, much larger than it was three years ago, um, but the demand for money is also much, much larger than it was three years ago in large part because all the people who used to hold mortgage-backed securities as their reserves and say this is our safe reserve of cash um, or of cash-like asset, now say, are you kidding? A mortgage-backed security is the most risky thing imaginable. Um, we don't want to hold those. We want to hold real cash instead. Um, and if you go and you talk to Mark Zandi and Alan Blinder, um, they'll tell you that by expanding the money supply, by getting all this extra cash in the system, the Federal Reserve kept the unemployment rate at 10% and kept it from rising to 15%. But as long as that extra demand for cash is there, the fact that the government's created a bunch more of safe financial assets in the economy isn't going to be terribly inflationary. There is the unwinding problem, the exit strategy problem, of what does the Federal Reserve do in order to get rid of all those extra assets when confidence returns to normal and when people no longer want to hold this extra cash because they're no longer so scared of holding risky assets. And that's going to be an interesting and delicate operation the Federal Reserve has been planning for three years now. Um, but that's, not, that's where we'll be in three years um, with a possible inflationary overhang. Um, if the Federal Reserve doesn't manage that transition swiftly. 
Um, that's really not where we are right now. Yeah? Uh, just as long as we're on this graph, what yeah. about um, the, the increase in the movement towards a greater and greater uh, hourglass economy and the moving away from production based growth towards more concentrated growth in, say, investment or, say, non physical? Mm. I want to kick those questions to, well, two groups of people. I want to kick them to David Card um, on the northwest corner of the sixth floor of Evans and to Emmanuel Saez, who's a little bit south of him along the west front. Uh, simply because David knows an awful lot more than I do about the extent to which the the failure to increase the sizes of America's public colleges and universities and keep them affordable over the past generation and a half has played in producing a two-tier economy uh, by which those who uh, manage to get a high-class college education do very well. Um, those who don't, don't. And a lot of people who really ought to be going to college don't because it's expensive and they don't want to be 22 year old, 22 years old and owe a hundred thousand bucks to the government that they can't discharge via bankruptcy. Um, you know, it was, um, so back in 19, <coughs> when was it done? Um, it was the spring of 1979 and I was sitting where you were, um, except the person up here was Harvard's Richard Freeman. Um, who was brought in for a guest lecture to tell, talk to us about income distribution and income inequality. And he looked out at us and he said, you all are here at Harvard, but it's a really lousy investment. Um, if you'd spent the equivalent amount of time not going to Harvard, but instead simply going to work at some reasonably high quality blue collar job, well, you'd have had an extra four years worth of earnings under your belt. Um, you'd have gained a lot of experience. You'd have probably been promoted and eventually have reached some kind of supervisory or management track. And you'd have all the tuition that you didn't spend banked and throwing off interest. Um, you would accept, he said, for those who are for a small proportion, um, be on a trajectory to having higher lifetime wealth than you do by going to a four-year college. Um, that was the situation that we were in back in 1980. Um, that, yes, the people who went to college were on average richer than the people who didn't, um, but they would have been richer if they hadn't gone to college. Right? That parceling out the native intelligence and the social connections facts, factors, college didn't seem to add anything um, to your lifetime earning potential because it subtracted a bunch at the beginning and decreased experience and in upfront costs, and the higher salaries you got thereafter didn't quite make up for that. Um, and back then, the kind of college high school wage premium was on the order of 25% um, here in America. Um, now it's up at 80%. Right, um, now you people are making the most extraordinarily high value investment that you could possibly make investing in your human capital. Uh, now it's no longer the case that you won't recoup um, your college costs in your working lifetime, but instead by the time you hit 33 for all of you, you'll be richer um, than if you had taken all your college tuition and banked it um, and saved it and also worked building some experience and some career in which experience mattered. Um, and yet, in spite of that, um, in spite of that enormous swelling of the college high school wage premium since 1980, um, right now your cohort, well, those of you who are white, male, and native born, um, your cohort is going to college at a lower rate than mine was. Um, you know, women are going to college at a much higher rate. Um, Non-whites are going to college at a much higher rate. Um, Non-native born are going to college at a much higher rate. But us white native born um, male guys uh, are not. 
And it seems the reason we're not is because the upfront price tag in college looks extremely expensive. Yeah? Um, well, the gap, the falling blue-collar wages haven't fallen very much, if at all. Um, what has happened is blue-collar wages haven't been growing at the steady 2% per year we expected before 1973. Um, and here I'm out of my depth. I didn't expect to talk about this. Uh, Bob Reich has these numbers in his head. David Card has his numbers in his head. Emmanuel Sayas has these numbers in his head. I need at least half an hour um, to refresh my recollection in order to properly discourse on them. Um, at any event, but I was about to say doom, um, or at least doom for all of you who don't plan on making the most of your time at Berkeley and on making sure that your children do something equivalent. Um, because the big public policy implication of this recession appears to be a further cutback on the state's role in education in every single state in the United States, which means that public college is going to be much more expensive to people a generation younger than you are than it is to you. And so even though we say, what are you worrying about? You'll have, had the, you'll have the capacity to pay back all your student loans by the time you're 35, without living any worse than if you'd never gone to college at all, and then after 35, it's all gravy. Um, even though we say that, people don't believe us, and people aren't willing to take on, uh, people aren't willing to take on the risk. Um, the second part is the global overclass. Yeah, um, you know, the, not the top 10% or the top 5% of the American income distribution, or even the top 1%, but the top 0.1% of the American income distribution, which has absolutely blasted through out into the stratosphere over the past 20 years in a way that we have not seen since the Gilded Age um, of industrialization and John D. Rockefeller back a century ago. And for there, um, the best person to ask is Emmanuel Saez, also on the sixth floor whose work on this has been sufficiently influential to get him denounced by name by the Wall Street Journal. Um, and Emmanuel tends to oh, have a whole bunch of theories, and I don't think he'd want to bet the farm on any one of them right now. Um, safe to say that a whole bunch of things seem to be going on. Um, the two biggest things to me seem to first be somewhat of a winner-take-all, um, you know, economy. Uh, that it used to be that there would be, oh, I don't know what, um, 200,000 book reading groups in America. And no one would get paid for leading one, except maybe that other people would bring the cookies when they would meet once a week or once every two weeks to talk about a book. Um, now there's Oprah. And Oprah not just shakes the publishing industry, but Oprah pulls down something north of $50 million a year um, to shake um, the publishing industry. And indeed, Oprah does this job extraordinarily well. Um, if you want someone to run a book group and coffee circle, Oprah Winfrey is uniquely talented, um, as shown by the fact that so many of us would rather um, kind of hang out watching her on the TV um, rather than go down to Starbucks and hang out with the people we meet there or with our friends um, who are much less interesting. Um, but still, that produces an extraordinary peak in the income distribution. Um, second thing appears to be a more general shift in social norms. That it used to be that paying your CEO an absolutely stratospheric salary was a good way to get a strike started and to get your workers saying, hey, if you're paying him that much, why don't you just take all, fire him, um, split up his salary among the rest of us, and we'll do without a boss. Um, but I want to wait for what, to hear what Emmanuel says and give him another two years to work before I think more about income distribution. Um, okay, end of second 15-minute digression. This means we're going to have to talk fast to try to get through what I want to get through before the midterm. Um, so I went back and I looked at what I was saying back in the fall of 2008. Um, 
as the Federal Reserve was busily cutting interest rates in its last swing down to zero to desperately try to keep long-term real risky interest rates from rising as much. And back then I said we are in substantial trouble, right? That the collapse of the housing bubble had triggered a mortgage finance crisis that had then snowballed into a general financial crisis due to the lack of adequate risk controls and to excessive leverage in major banks that had then produced a flight to safety, a collapse in demand for risky assets, which meant that businesses couldn't borrow to conduct, to invest, build capacity, or even conduct their existing operations at the current scale, and that would, if unchecked, produce the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression itself. And I did back then say that normal stabilizing monetary policy could not help us anymore. Um, that the standard policy moves had been used to the full by the end of 2008. Um, nevertheless, back in 2008, um, I was very confident we were going to get out of this with only minor damage. If you told me that the unemployment rate would be above 9% at the end of 2010, I'd have said no. If you told me it was likely to be above 7.5% at the end of 2012, I'd have said, no, right? that's not going to happen, um, that we know how to deal with situations like this. Um, and indeed, um, indeed, we ought to have been able to do something about it. Right? Um, that is, the financial shock that set the downturn in motion, um, it really was remarkably small. Um, it is true that we got irrationally exuberant about the demand for housing and the trajectory of housing prices. And it is true that we built five million extra houses um, in places where people really don't want to live that much. Um, we built them in the swamps of Florida and the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque. And I don't know about you, but when I get, um, I don't know, say east of San Dimas, I start to get metaphysically thirsty and thinking I have to run back to at least an aqueduct or something or I'm going to die because there's just no water there. Um, and we simply should not have built those houses, right? That the cost of their construction was to a first approximation covered entirely by the mortgage debt the purchasers took on. No one put on any money down for those houses. And on an average one of those five million houses, you know, the purchaser took out a hundred thousand bucks in mortgage debt that simply was never going to be repaid. The buyer couldn't afford it. The house was not worth it which means that at the end of 2007, there were 500 billion of financial losses to be allocated. Um, that somebody's bonds and derivatives and assets were going to be worth $500 billion less than people had thought. Um, but, um, but we economists had a whole bunch of discussions um, along around uh, this in the, toward the end of 2007 and the start of 2008. And I remember one phone conversation with Larry Summers saying, look, $500 billion is a lot of money, but $4 trillion of wealth was lost in the collapse of the dot-com bubble, and the recession that followed that didn't send the unemployment rate above 7%. Um, and I agree this is different, that these are not, you know, venture capital equity investments, that these are debt securities, and it's unclear who holds them, but... Is it really the case that a shock one-eighth as large as the collapse of the dot-com bubble is going to produce a rise in the unemployment rate even, one, even as large as the dot-com bubble did, even up to 7%? And you know, that argument was strong and powerful and seemed to be the right one back at the end of 2007. That back then the betting was we were likely to escape recession completely. Um, very unlikely to have anything big going on. Um, for after all, the global economy has $80 trillion worth of financial wealth and a $500 billion loss due to irrational exuberance and malinvestment should not be a big problem. This is what we have sophisticated and liquid financial markets for. This is what we have originate and distribute securitization for, to slice, dice, and spread all of these risks around 
to make sure that nobody bears any significant part of them and so that nobody is ruined by any, any idiosyncratic things that happen in the way of defaults in the desert between Los Angeles and Albuquerque. Um, so where was the trap? Um, you know, um, the trap, right? Um, the trap was that the thumbnail explanation is the trap was set by regulatory forbearance. Um, that is that the decision in the 1980s and the 1990s to step back from regulating financial markets uh, on the grounds that financiers had their fortunes at risk and they knew their business and they knew their business better than regulators did. And because they were going to lose not just their wealth but their careers, uh, that we could judge on them to assess how much risk they should undertake. Um, and so we agreed to let banks up their leverage um, and I think the fatal mistake was made when we agreed to let banks count AAA rated securities as part of their core capital because then investment bankers said, hey, look, um, look at these AAA rated collateralized debt obligation tranches. They pay a tenth of a percentage point more than treasury bonds do. Um, we can hold them as tier one capital according to the Basel financial requirements that's free money, that makes us an extra one-tenth of percent per year on our entire safe, entire safe reserve portfolio. We got to take advantage of this. And yet they never turned around and asked their own issue departments, um, just what have you and your peers at other banks been persuading the rating agencies to rate as AAA these days? Um, or they asked and did not care about the answer. Um, perhaps because they thought their position would get marked to an overly exuberant market um, at the end of the year, that they would collect their bonuses and then they'd be gone, they'd be promoted or they'd quit for another firm and cleaning up the mess would be someone else's problem. Um, so when the 500 billion loss hit, it hit the capital of highly leveraged financial institutions and transformed all the liabilities of America's banks from safe, secure, and liquid high-quality assets to unsafe, insecure, and illiquid low-quality assets. And so whenever anything was offered on the market, it raised the natural question of why are you trying to sell this? What is wrong with it? What don't we know about this security that makes it worth less than you want me to buy it for? Because if it were worth more than what you want me to buy it for, you certainly wouldn't be selling it to me, um, would you? And this triggered an enormous um, flight to quality. Um, that's what's going on here with this spike in long-term real risky interest rates. You had a $500 billion fundamental loss in the sense that 500 billions of mortgages wasn't going to be paid back. And yet it triggered a $20 trillion decline in the global value of financial asset values as everyone tried to dump their risky assets and build up the safe assets in their portfolios. And as John Stuart Mill knew back in 1929, whenever you have a large excess demand in finance, it's going to be mirrored um, by a large deficient demand for currently produced goods and services. Um, a general glut, you know, unsold commodities pretty much everywhere and unemployed workers pretty much everywhere as well. Um, now, could this meltdown have been avoided? You know, of course, proper financial regulation or proper enforcement of existing financial regulations or even proper control of their derivatives books by the senior managers of highly leveraged financial institutions would have prevented it. Um, if you have financial institutions that are too big to fail, then you need to regulate them, so not only so that they don't fail, but so that they are never perceived to be in danger of failing. If you aren't going to regulate them, then you shouldn't have institutions that are too big to fail. Um, and if the originate and distribute securitization model had actually been followed, if the banks had sold off all the mortgage-backed securities they'd created instead of keeping a bunch of them on their own portfolios, um, well, then the $500 billion in losses would have spread out over the entire globe. It would have not threatened the integrity of any piece of the financial system. It would have been like the collapse of the dot-com bubble where a bunch of rich people get a bloody nose, but there are no large systemic consequences for the economy as a whole. Um, 
But even after you've failed to do the regulatory job, and even after banks' top management have failed to do the risk control job, um, we really didn't have to get here. You know, the nationalization of housing finance at the start of 2008 would have prevented it. Um, if the United States government had said at the start of 2008 that housing finance was a broken mess, and that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two big semi-private mortgage companies, were now arms of the government and were going to buy up all the mortgages in the country and sort things out, there would have been no big downturn. There would have been political complaints as people said, but why are you letting these mortgage brokers escape without taking the big losses that they deserve to take? Why are you putting these on the backs of the taxpayer? And that would have been a serious consideration. Uh, but it would have been worth doing it because it would have kept the unemployment rate at 6% rather than spiking up to 10%. And indeed, the U.S. government would probably have made money on the deal. That the cost of capital to the U.S. government is very low, and the universe of even subprime mortgages was not that impaired, or at least wasn't that impaired, until we began getting excess millions of unemployed. Because right now, most foreclosures are, exist not because people made stupid investments ex ante in buying houses they couldn't afford, but because people who could afford to pay the mortgages on their houses have lost their jobs and have been unable to find right, any new ones. Um, even after that, right, nationalization of as many investment banks as necessary in the spring, summer, and fall of 2008 would have prevented it. Um, the U.S. government could have zeroed out shareholders and option holders and rescued each bank from a run as it happened. It would have had to nationalize Bear Stearns, Lehman, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG, Citigroup, um, and a few others. But as long as it guaranteed the liabilities of investment and commercial banks, there would have been no general impairment of quality and no flight to safety. Now, admittedly, that would have made left let required letting concerns about moral hazard go out the window and letting people who had made really stupid investments escape with their fortunes but you know that's not the worst thing in the world um, or the US government could simply have done what the Swedish government did in 1992-93 and nationalized the banks um, say we're contributing a huge bunch of money to these banks but we're doing so only by getting stock in return, so we're now the dominant majority owners. Um, but we didn't do any of those things, right? that they all seem to be involved too much government intervention for Treasury Secretary Paulson to want to do them. Um, Paulson decided that it was time to let creditors see what the consequence of not doing due diligence on their portfolio was, and in the fall of 2008 decided that he was going to let the investment bank of Lehman Brothers fail um, and not do anything to pump government money into it. And then in the next 72 hours he reversed himself and said, well, now that Lehman Brothers has failed, we have a catastrophe on our hands. We need to intervene in financial markets very much. And in fact, we need to contribute not just $30 billion to rescuing Lehman Brothers, we need Congress to vote us $730 billion. We need Congress to vote us $700 billion to use to try to rescue the financial system as a whole because we have a serious crisis on our hands. Um, and let me stop there and say I'll pick up the story next time.